Hi, welcome to the April 20th, 2021 Cloud Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test on my end to make sure everything is coming through. Hi, welcome to. Okay, everything sounds fine there. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the Club Cubase live stream today. Uh, I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist focusing on Steinberg products. Uh, and I, I'm presenting from the United States uh, outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in the live chat field or you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. <clears throat> we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. When asking questions, if you could, uh, the ability to ask questions will far exceed my capability to answer them in a real-time manner. So realize that if you type a question, it may take me a little while to get to it. We'll try to go through these chronologically so that we could get through as many questions in order as they were asked. And towards the end, we'll get to questions that were submitted via email. When asking questions, uh, so if you <clears throat> have asked your question, you don't see an immediate response. If we could try to avoid asking the same question repeatedly, that would be helpful. And as we, uh, as questions are asked, if we could try to get to the point where um, we say I'm running Cubase Pro 11 on Mac OS or Cubase 10.5 Elements on Windows 10, uh, sometimes the version number what level of Cubase you're running, as well as the operating system. That information is helpful. I'm going to go ahead and just close a couple of programs that I probably have unnecessarily open in the background. Bear with me just for a second. Now we see my calendar. All right. And we will, if, and for those people that are watching live, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, uh, that would be wonderful information. We will wait a minute or two for people to get logged in. Um, like many of you, my family is at home, so my wife is working directly above me. Uh, my son is at school, but will be coming home in the middle, so I may get interrupted. Uh, so I apologize for any interruptions, but we'll try to go to for about four hours today. We will have a detailed list of all of the uh, topics that have been covered in the live streams. Uh, for for this particular live stream, we'll have a uh, an index of all the topics covered with timestamps, so you could jump directly to the particular uh, topic if you see one. So we'll have that posted in the comments field. Uh, and if you wanted to search for previous live streams, you could go to uh, Jan from Stockholm, who's usually on the live streams. Uh, he's created a website called cubaseindex.com. And if you go to that website, you could actually search for, uh, you could type in a question and see if it's been covered in a live stream. Uh, we also have Agent K, who's kind enough to do some moderation as needed. And when we... Uh, also another wonderful, uh, resource of information for Steinberg products is if you go to the Cubase Nation Discord, uh, and Jazz Dude is, is kind enough to compile a lot of information there with some others. So let's go ahead and see quickly who's on the live stream before we get started. So I see, uh, Sir Robert from Atlanta. Great to see him. We have John Hinchy from Nashville, Alex Morgan from Los Angeles. All right, so we have Rob from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Robbie Bowling from Dallas. Filter Freak, who's happy he's made it his 12th time in a row from sunny UK. All right, so we have Jason in uh, York, UK. We have Walter, uh, Walter Blackledge from St. Louis. Okay, so we have Pylon Records. We have John Costigan from Kenosha. All right, we have Trond from Norway. We have Pablo from Galicia, España. All right, so we have Stefan from Sweden. Um, 
All right, so we have Sub403 from British Columbia, Uno from Finland, Ted Springman, great to see you on from Sherman Oaks. All right, so we have, and Agent K wants everyone to not forget to hit the thumbs up that allows us to continue to do these live streams. Uh, we have Chance202020 from Berkshire, UK. All right, so Pylon Records is from Los Angeles. We have Taylor Sapp from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay, we have Brussels, we have from the UK. We have Danielle from Italy. Welcome to the live stream. And this is your, if this is your first live stream, um, let us know that as well. Okay. All right, so we have Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo, Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas. All right, so I have Gabriel, who's from Bogota. We have Rio de Janeiro. Welcome. All right, so we see that we have uh, Jan from CubaseIndex.com. All right, so we have, I think it's Moshi or Mosi Marketing from Rio de Janeiro. So. My college roommates recently relocated there. His wife's working at the American Embassy. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at questions, and let's get started. Um, so question, may I ask you an approximate date when you're planning to make Cubase available even without a dongle? So Steinberg has announced that they will be pursuing uh, licensing management systems that won't require the USB dongle. I still think it's months off, so we may see it. Uh, nothing has been announced yet, but I think that we may actually, um, it's, uh, that you may see it, uh, coming up, you know, it might be, you know, in the, in the autumn. So I'm not sure exactly. I, you know, one of the things that Steinberg is doing is just kind of being upfront and letting people know of the different developments. So when they made the initial announcement, there's also been a, secondary announcements. So I think we'll see kind of continued announcements like that. All right. So we have a question from John Hinchy. Uh, in uh, Groove Agent and Cubase, create drum map from instrument. In, uh, in DE, uh, I, I drag drums vertically. I guess drum editor, I drag drums vertically into order I want it. How do I save this setup so I can use it in the next Cubase project and drums will be in the same vertical order. Okay, so let's say if I'm here and I have a groove agent and I look at this, I could just say, okay, I got some different sounds. And let's say I want to extract um, the drum map from this so that when we look at our drum map and we go to the editor, and I'll make this editor kind of full screen. And now let's say if I wanted to just kind of change the order of the notes here. So let's say, okay, I wanted this to, uh, I want to see my kick and let's say my snare and let's say my hi-hat. So while these aren't mapped chromatically, I wanted to see these particular notes in that order. So if I've modified the drum map, what I have to do now is to just come to the drum map here and we'll go to drum map setup. Uh, if you click on the functions, uh, we could just do a save and then we'll just call this John Hinchy. Okay, so at this point, what I could do is I will come, let's just change this to uh, a general MIDI drum map. So we see kind of this kind of mapped uh, accordingly, but now I could just go to my drum map setup. Let's go to functions, load, and where we could just now open up our John Hinchy drum map. 
Uh, and at that point, we could see that our drum map will automatically be carried over C, D, and F sharp. So you could just go to the drum map setup. And at this point, uh, so once we, we are here, just go to your drum map setup. And then under functions, just save it. And then you could uh, update it or give it a new name and call that up later. Okay, so from we have a question from Alex Morgan. Hi, Greg. I hope you're well. I emailed you, suggested, but I wondered if you had a moment to look into a preset for deleting muted parts on a track-by-track, -track, not global basis. Thanks again. So I think we showed this maybe in the last live stream or previous live stream. But um, So I, I came up with a macro to to erase muted events on a selected track. So let's say I wanted to not globally erase every muted event, but only on a particular selected track. So I made a project logical editor preset. Um, and here we're gonna just choose to delete. We'll say our container type is equal to event is muted and event is selected. Um, now the problem I was having before on some previous live streams was getting this to only function on a particular track. So I created a macro and let's go over here to uh, our key commands. In the macro, I just called it uh, delete muted events on selected tracks. So if I have this particular track selected, I chose to have edit select all on tracks and then process the project logical editor preset. So go to that project logical editor uh, preset that that preset that we just created. So we'll open this one more time. And we're, we're just going to save this under click on store preset and give it a name. Once that preset has been created, that will show up uh, under the key commands under project process project logical editor. So we'll come here and we'll see this process project logical editor and every preset that you've made can now be triggered. So what I did was to select all the events on that track and if the track is selected and muted per the project logical editor, it will then be deleted. So to delete all of the muted events on this selected track, not on other tracks, I can go here, let's go to our macros and we could assign a keyboard shortcut for this. So we say delete muted events on selected tracks. So now we can see that this track is just deleted those two. And if I select on this track, it'll delete the part just in the middle. And so I'll come over here edit to trigger that macro and again to uh, delete muted events on a selected track. So at that point that will be deleted. And to do this again, go to your project logical editor, set up that condition, save it as a preset, and now go into the key commands and just have these two functions set as a macro and you could trigger that with a, a MIDI message or your own keyboard shortcut. So I'll show it one more time, just a little bit longer. So once again, uh, delete muted events on selected notes. So it's edit, select all on tracks, and then process that project logical editor. Okay, so we see a question from uh, John Hinchy, uh, logical editor, filter off beats. How can I change this so it only selects the off beats but does not delete them? So I think this is one of the presets that comes uh, with a logical editor. So let's say if I had a number of hi-hats, an incredibly exciting part. Okay, so, and I want it to select uh, the upbeats of each of those. So we'll go to our MIDI, to logical editor, and I think this might be under one of the standard sets. Um, just take a look for it here.
Okay, so we have filter off beats as a preset. So what this could do is automatically delete these particular notes. So instead of choosing delete as the function, just choose select. So now when I do this, I could just say apply, and then it's gonna select all the notes that are not on the particular, uh, not on the beat, but on the up beats. So, and then you could just save that as select. Instead of filter off beats, just switch the function to select. Okay, uh, so we just see, hi guys, uh, from Jason in York, UK. Don't know if you've dealt with this, but I want to speed up the tempo of a vocal track and quantize it so it's in time. How can I do that? So if you want it to, so, you know, we could do your vocals quite easily, but you may also, um, let's go ahead and give this a try in a project with some vocals here. So once something has a tempo stamp in it, so if you've recorded it into Cubase, it's automatically going to have a particular tempo stamp that's embedded as metadata uh, in the particular file. So now when I come here, let's say if I have my tempo at 80, I'll just turn this down, sorry about that. Let's say I have this down into 80 beats a minute. And if I have like all of my tracks here set to musical mode, so let's say I have my vocal track set to musical mode, and now I come here and I just type in a new tempo, let's say 120. So let's say, okay, I want it to be, we'll go back to, not eight beats a minute, but we'll try 80. And let's say I just adjust the tempo here. And slow down the tempo. So once you have kind of the initial tempo value that's been captured during the recording process, just enable musical mode. And then whatever tempo you have, it will just automatically follow. And you can do that across all of your multi-tracks as well. Okay, let's go through more questions here. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And again, as you learn new things, make sure you hit the like button. Okay, so we see Reg Edit still using 8.5 Pro. So yeah, consider upgrading or, or updating. There's lots of great stuff. Okay, uh, question from Taylor. How do you copy sound A to B in Hallion Sonic SE? So let's go ahead and just add a new instant of Hallion Sonic SE. Okay, so. So I think if we copy program, let's go to slot two, right click and paste program, that that will kind of do the trick. So again, copy program, select the slot here, and then just paste program, that that should be able to kind of, so you could cut copy paste just by right clicking. So let me know if that, if you're wanting to do something else, uh, Taylor, but I think that should try just simply right clicking and copy, go to the slot where you want 
and paste. Okay, so we have a question from Pablo. Can automation be transferred from a MIDI track to an audio track? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. So let's say if I have automation here. Okay. Make sure I have the order right. Okay, so we have a MIDI track here. So I'm just going to select the automation and I will copy. Let's go to our audio track here and paste. And if I want it to be at the same exact time, so you can just kind of paste directly from the uh, logical, from a MIDI part to a directly to, so automation from MIDI track to an audio part. But Pablo, let me know if you're looking for MIDI CC data, if it's MIDI CC data. You may have to go to the MIDI and go to the CC automation setup. And then you could just say, uh, for the MIDI part, I wanted it to go to MIDI or in that could be a, like, let's say if we're on um, CC7, we could choose that to be on a MIDI part or we could choose it to be on an automation part. So, but give that a try, let us know. Okay, so we have a question. How do I use pitch bend snap to pitch? Okay. Okay, so a lot of times when we start working with particular uh, pitch bend, so let's say if I wanted to go to my Hallion here, and let me just load up a sound in that particular channel. Okay, so let's say I wanted to, you know, come over here and you could often set your pitch bend range, you know, per instrument. So I think if we wanted to, um, I always forget where it is, but we may. Okay, so we come over here, we could, you know, set your pitch bend range per instrument. So let's say if I wanted to now draw in, let me just see if I could do it in Retrolog, just so I make sure I have it set correctly. Okay, so let's say if I come, I have this particular sound in Retrolog. All right, so right now I have my pitch bend set to uh, plus and minus an octave. Or so I have it up to, let's say I want it down, uh, down to, so it's pretty typical. So now when I move my pitch bend wheel, I could go up a whole step or I could go down a whole step. So pitch bend up, pitch bend down. So if I wanted to now, the problem is that pitch bend is kind of a 14 bit MIDI message and it could have a value of 
16,384. So let's say if I have just one note here that I've drawn in, we can now go to, let's say our pitch bend data. So we're gonna look at pitch bend and this is new in version 11 is you could now set the range up. So instead of going, you know, 16,384, which there's no real correlation going on with the actual pitch that was hard to get a sense of. So now we could say, show me the semitones grid and we're gonna match this so that as I draw pitch bend data in, so I'll come here and we could choose to have this automatically snap. So I could say at this point, I want it to be exactly uh, one semitone up and let me just, Sorry, let me just remove. Okay, so I'm gonna to choose to ramp. All right, so, so now if I want it to go exactly to one semitone, um, at that point you could just choose different semitone values so that you can say, okay, I want this to resolve directly on a particular pitch. So we know that this line is gonna be one semitone up, this line will be one semitone up, and then we could just have that automatically go directly in tune because there's nothing worse than doing pitch bend and having it be out of tune for the rest of the track. So we'll go ahead and listen to it. Then the pitch bend will kick in. And then it's going to go slowly down over two semitones over this time. And it's going to snap to be directly in tune. So that gives you kind of a musical context where, and if you had the semitone range set for an octave, you could now just have the pitch bend automatically scale, but this should be matched to what the pitch bend range on your particular instrument is set to. Okay, question, how do I open note expression on a note in Cubase 11, double click erases the note? So this is one of the new little changes. So let's say I have some notes. Okay, so it used to be in previous versions that you could double click and see the uh, note expression editor come. And by default in Cubase 11 to kind of speed things up, you could now double click to erase notes. And to toggle that behavior, you just go to this little E icon here uh, on the toolbar, enable that, and now when you double click, the note expression editor will open. When that is disabled, you double click on a note and the note is erased. But with that enabled, now that you double click on a note, it'll open the note expression editor. So look for this little E at the very top and that will allow you to toggle the behavior for the new method to automatically erase a note or to double click and open the uh, expression editor. All right. Right. And occasionally my chat field will jump on me. So I apologize for that in advance. Like it just did.
Okay, so we have uh, from Sub Four Three two questions. Uh, first, chord pads aren't playing properly when I hit a when I hit this C note. It includes it into the chord I've assigned to G minor seven, uh, with which also has a C note. So let's say if I'm triggering a chord pad. So let me just jump to a new project here. Uh, here I'll just. Okay, so say if I have kind of a Rhodes. All right, so I'm gonna go to the chord pads. And now when I go to the chord pads, let's say. Okay, so it says, um, so when I hit the C note, it includes it in the chord uh, I've assigned uh, G minor seventh. All right, so let's say if I come here and let's say I'll just go ahead and record. So I'll go ahead and just change this chord voicing here quickly. So let's change this to um, make sure I have the right chord. So G minor seventh. Okay, and now I will go ahead and record. So let's say. Just hitting the C note and let's go ahead and take a look at what chords have actually been what notes have transpired so I don't see the actual note uh, being recorded here so we have a G we have an F B flat and a D so that's a note that I was triggering that particular chord pad from so now that we've done this, now what could be causing it is something to try is instead of all MIDI inputs, try just to set it to the chord pads as the MIDI input as well and see if that makes a difference for you sub a difference for you sub four or three. Okay, so we have a Question from Pablo, why doesn't render in place transfer the automation? Is it a bug? Okay, so let's say if I have a drum loop here. Okay, and I'm gonna just draw in some automation. All right, so now we have this going on. So we have this get softer and louder and fade out again. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the render in place. So let's go to edit to render in place. And let's get to our render settings. And I think that you might have to include the complete signal path. Let's give it a shot. Um, so I will mute the source tracks and now Let me just select the event here one more time. Sorry about that. Okay, so now that we've rendered that in place, we can see that this will include the volume changes. So as we play this back and look at the automation, this volume level of the rendered file is following the automation. So it really depends upon your edit in place, your render in place settings. 
So if I wanted to come over here, just make sure that when you do the render in place, Pablo, that you have the complete signal path plus master effects selected. And that I'll try quickly with just a complete signal path. And that works, but if I wanted to choose, um, let's try just a channel settings. I don't think that will include the automation. So it looks like that is as well. Let's try the very top one. So let's do the render settings dry. So if you do it dry, that won't incorporate the automation, but again, coming over here with the render settings, make sure that you have channel settings, complete signal path or complete signal path plus master effects selected. And that should incorporate and embed the automation directly into the event for you, Pablo. All right, so we see that Sundancer Rhythms running Pro 10. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Frederico's his first time watching live. Thank you for joining us uh, from Buenos Aires in Argentina. All right, so we have Jolly Malone, who's also checking in from the Netherlands, who's a singer-songwriter using Cubase elements uh, for Irish folk music. Thanks for joining Okay, so I see uh, from Dallas LaRue, the X for Crossfade still doesn't work, but has never worked in any version of Cubase I have ever had. Could it be an internal setting? So I think last time we talked about it maybe being, uh, let me just duplicate this event here. So, you know, just selecting these two and hitting X. So as we've done that, that will, you know, so these two events are just overlapping. That would just do the X. So if you still don't have it working, and the one thing that I'd mentioned before was if these events were set to parts. So let's say if I had this event here, so let's say I just copied this over here and then I hit X that we don't see if it's set to a part that the crossfade won't work, but if it's set, so if you've gone through and check your audio menu and dissolve the part, and now that when you will take this and do a crossfade. So if that still is not working for you, it could be that your your you know crossfade key command is set differently. So if you want to check that, you could go to your your edit menu to key commands, and just you'll see type in key. Just hit X, and that should show you what the X key is assigned to. So if you don't see audio crossfade, you'll need to go to the audio menu and select crossfade and you could just check to make sure that the X is actually doing a crossfade for you. That's the key that's assigned to trigger that function. Okay, so we have a question uh, for the Groove Agent SE. Can I download three, four time signature drums? These are not available in mine. So let's go ahead and take a quick look. Uh, I think there's there may be a couple. We'll, we'll take a look and see if we could find some. But so let's say I want to come over here. So, and if I wanted to go to this little extender window, uh, we could go to the browser. And here you could actually just see three, four. So I'm not sure if these are uh, included. 
with the program, but you could filter out the different drum kits by different, uh, and you'll see under musical, you could just see signature. And then you could see if there's, I'm not sure if these are add-ons or not, but if there are three, four that are included, you could just simply uh, find it that way. There's maybe in some add-on packs, I'm not absolutely sure. So question, how easy to upgrade from 10 to 11 will it retain all settings and plugins? So yeah, it should automatically carry those forward. Uh, what you could do in your 10 is just go to your edit menu and go to your profile manager if you want to just be safe and export your profile. And then in version 11, you could import it, uh, but it should automatically by default carry over the different settings. Okay, so we have a second question from sub403. Uh, in the editor, the keyboard on the left lights up all different colors. Is there a way to stop this from happening? So let's say if, if I'm in my editor here, I'll make this full screen. So as, as, we, as I just kind of play in, I see that that turns white. Let's say if I wanted to play back the parts here. So it looks like it only kind of turns white as I'm playing it in. And if you wanted to record directly from here as well, you're, you're able uh, to do that. So just directly from the keyboard. So if you want to just put in a quick so if you wanted to just get some avant-garde uh, music, you could do that. But it looks like it's only lighting up as those keys are pressed uh, on my kind of edit screen. So let me know if let me know if yours is different. All right, wonderful to see Gareth on the live stream as well as Michael Pierce. He's going to be dropping in. He's finishing up some work. See lots of people giving Jan kudos for his uh, cubaseindex.com. All right, so we have Soren in Sweden joining us. Great to see you on the live stream. All right, Gareth is apparently on vacation in Ice Station Zebra so that we could have a representative from Antarctica. Thank you for that. All right, great to see Fonz Flex on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. All right, so um, just see, maybe you got my mail confused with MIDI logical editor. Um, so let's go ahead, since uh, we have that, let me just find a particular mail. Okay, so this is, um, okay, so we had a question, uh, and this was mailed in, it says, in your tutorial of four minutes, you're setting a note range for the random value between, but in my case, the range can't be fill in with note, but only with uh, arithmetic values from zero to 127. Uh, I did a tried with different values, but I get the results are very confusing, okay. So let's take a look at the logical editor. So let's say, um, let's say I wanted to set random, let's say we wanted to just select, uh, let's just say, okay, we want to take, 
delete notes between like a particular note range. So we'll say notes and then we're going to say inside range. So, so we'll say property is set to, I think it's, or maybe, Just find the inside range here quickly. Okay, so we'll say inside range. And I think it was setting up. Um, like the particular note values here. So. So let's say I just want to delete. Um, value one, and then we'll say inside range. Okay, so when we go to like here, what we wanted to do is just to type in like a note. So a lot of times when I go to type in notes now, and this may be kind of a weird misbehavior, um, it doesn't seem to take the pitch that we enter in, in this version. So what you can do is instead of coming over here to type in the, to figure out what the value is, try just to hit, um, you know, when you get values like this is just to hit the MIDI note message. And then you could set the value just by capturing the particular MIDI note message. So I know this may be different than what you've seen on some videos, but if you need to set the range, say, okay, I want it to go between this note and that note, just hit, just double click and hit the MIDI note message and that will capture the MIDI note right there. Okay, um, so you see in scale assistant C major, I apply the MIDI logical editor without the letter C or any musical system because I can't. Um, so I think if you had a bunch of notes, uh, it says, and I get the same notes in red, so I have to quantize pitch to stay in C major, but if you have the opportunity to make an example. So if you wanted to quantize like the notes uh, to particular, I will just go ahead and put this in quickly. Let's say, I'll extend this part. So as I click here, I just want to put in, say, half notes. So we have a lot of notes here that are set um, on accidental notes on black keys. So let's say if I come here, we can see that's uh, G sharp one, G sharp one, A sharp one, C sharp. So a lot of black keys there. So if I wanted to take this and transform it to a particular key from the logical editor without having to quantize the pitch from the scale assistant, um, you could do that just by, let's go to our logical editor. And I'm going to choose to transform and we'll just say MIDI notes. And we wanted to take uh, value one 
and choose transpose to scale. And then here you could just choose C major. And as I do this, it will now transpose all the notes so that none of them are on the black keys. And if I wanted to quantize the pitch here to C major, um, I could just choose quantize pitch and that will also move them and kind of get you the same area. But I could just say, uh, so we're gonna take our notes, trans we're gonna transform notes and we're gonna take the pitch value one and we're gonna transpose that to the scale of D major. So now I hit apply and those notes will all conform to D major. So give that a shot and let us know if that helps you. But you know, for the values where it just seems like it's only accepting numbers, just hit the MIDI note message and that will that will fill in that field and you should be able to kind of move forward. Sorry, it's I know it's a little confusing. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, why, when I use hide all automation from the panel or any other way, the audio tracks in the mixer that are from multiple output for VSTi does exactly the inverse. So we talked about this in the last live stream a bit. So let's say if I have um, a output here, let's say if I have multiple outputs, routed in my mixer. Okay, so now when I come and let's say if I have lots of automation lanes open with lots of automation, Okay, so now when I have my automation lanes open, so what we could do is let's open up the automation panel and I'll just choose to hide all automation. So when we do that, all the automation is hidden, but for some reason it does open up all of the outputs. Now, while these aren't automation tracks, um, they do kind of show automation for the particular output since there's nothing else to really show there for that. But you know, but the automation tracks themselves are hidden. So technically these aren't automation tracks, but I understand it's a little confusing that it opens up the outputs and I'll I'll pass that along uh, to see if there's any reason reasoning or thought behind that. Okay, uh, so we have just a question. Can you show us a shortcut to activate deactivate cycle loop function? And in, in the internet, I read the command should be num slash, uh, but can't find it in a window keyboard such as mine. So it's on a numeric keypad, like off on the right hand side where you have like, you know, the zero, you have the, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And there you'll have just like an asterisk, like a, a little slash and just hitting that button on the slash. If your keyboard doesn't have a numeric keypad, it may have like a function key or numeric keypad where you could have a smaller keyboard have the have you know keys within the uh, within a keyboard function as a numeric keypad but it's from a numeric keypad and it's just a slash on a numeric keypad. So if your keyboard doesn't have one, it may be kind of superimposed on another letter when holding down a modifier key, but it is just this slash on it. The num, the N-U-M is just a numeric keypad. So you just hit that. And if you can't get it to work, you could always just kind of double, you could just click right here or click on the transport to get the same functionality.
All right, wonderful to see Michael Teams on our live stream. Okay, uh, we have a question. I have to jump around many interfaces, et cetera, and always configure I.O. very much from scratch. Is there an easier way to build up my project from an empty state? 32 I.O. is over 100 clicks now. So once you're in, I don't really have a multi-input or output device, uh, but let's go. if you go to your audio connections, and let's say uh, if I just remove my bus, so try just going directly to the bus here. So my interface has four outputs. So I'm gonna click on add bus. And then I'm gonna say, I want it to be stereo. And now I want it to be two stereos. And this could be three stereos or 32 mono ins. And if you do it like this, click add bus, it will now automatically just kind of uh, fill the order so if I had multiple inputs, I click on add bus with no, let's say I have no buses and type in 32 mono inputs and hit add bus and that will add them all sequentially for you. So that way you could do that. And once you have that done, just, you know, if you do it once, just save it as a preset. So say this is this audio interface, 32 mono in, 16 stereo in, this interface, you know, two stereo in, whatever your output configuration is, save it as a preset. And then you won't have to constantly redo your IO settings constantly. So, but click on the add bus set the configuration and the numbers and that will automatically increment the routing for you for those inputs so you don't have to do it one by one which you can do if you're getting paid by the hour i guess so all right great to see pro wash dfw on the live stream all right jazz dude has made his appearance he's probably been on for a half hour already but thanks for joining us jazz dude he's always incredibly helpful Okay, so we have a question. Hey, Greg, can you explain how control room works, especially the possibilities you can have with it? Uh, I cannot get it, thanks. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so the control room, the kind of one of the main intentions is to have a volume monitoring that's decoupled from the actual master fader. Because if I bring the master fader down in a project, um, that will affect the gain structure of the mix of the file that I export. Where if I adjust the volume of the control room, this is only going to control the monitoring volume. So, and we can set up the control room by going into your audio connections. You'll see control room. Make sure that you activate it and turn it on. This will allow us to have a talkback microphone. We could have external inputs. Uh, so if someone comes up with their iPad or their phone and they want to have a wired connection directly in, you could also come over here, have guitar, like headphone mixes. You could have dedicated headphone monitors. You could have up to four different monitor speakers. So let's say if I'm here and I'm just mixing and I wanted to just control the monitoring volume without affecting the gain structure of the mix. So as we're here, if, I, if we watch our master fader, if I drop this down, we can see that the master fader reflects that change. But when I adjust the monitoring level, at this point, it doesn't affect the gain structure of my master fader. It's just my actual monitoring volume. Now, we can set this up to also uh, have a dim. So let's say this is as loud as I want to mix, but I want to check quickly my dim so I could have it go down in volume. I could also set a reference by holding down uh, 
Alt or Option. So now if I'm here, I could just say, let's go back. This is the loudest point that I want to monitor at. And I want it to dim that. So you have a known reference point. If we go to your down mix presets, we could also monitor this in mono to make sure that's gonna collapse correctly. So if you do this down from, from 5.1 to stereo to quad. If we click on the main here, we could also have your the amount of your talk you have you know, your talk back, but you could also set your dim amount. Now, if I wanted to actually, instead of just soloing a track, I wanted the R tracks to go down in volume, we could click on the L button. And how much the R tracks are brought down in volume is adjusted. So now if I wanted to just hear that in context with the air tracks, but have those tracks be softer. So say, okay, let's see what the kick is doing instead of soloing the kick. I could just bring the kicks up. So that's very handy. Now, if we have more than one pair of studio monitors, we could connect these to our outputs. And when we go to our monitors, I can say, okay, I have my Yamahas. I want to switch to JBLs, to my Genelex, to monitor four, say Oritones, whatever you want these to be. So, and if you wanted to, set the volume level between each of the monitors so that you have consistent volume levels, we could do that as well. Uh, there's the ability to set up independent headphone mixes. So if you're recording musicians and they need, each need to have their own dedicated headphone mix, like a more me headphone mix, we could also do that directly in the control room. So that's a couple of things to get started with in control room. But I, once you kind of, you know, when you first start it, it may take just a minute to kind of wrap your head around it. One of the first things you want to do is once you activate the control room monitor is just to have the output turned on, but not connected. Otherwise the signal can get kind of doubly bust and kind of be, well, can play back twice, which can be confusing. So those are a couple possibilities. All right. All right, so I see according to Pablo, I'm La Leche. I still think he's calling me milk from my high school Spanish, but it's supposedly a term of endearment, so or respect and admiration, so. Okay, so we have a question. If I map a QC for a third-party plugin, i.e. compressor, and I save as preset, will this preset work only if I open that compressor in the same insert, so. I don't think I have many third-party plugins, but let's see if I can get something going on here. Let's take a quick look. I thought I had. 
had one, but it might be just an instrument. But let's go ahead and just try it with um, there's a third party. We could do the, the curve EQ. So I'm going to drag that as an insert there. Okay, so if I want to go to Okay, so let's say if I want to learn just I'll just try it with a this may not be the best example plug in I'll just try it with a compressor. Okay, I'll do it with a Yamaha plugin. So it's technically a third party. So let's say if I wanted to come here. Okay, so let's Okay, so let's say we have these set up here, then I think all you have to do now is let's save preset. All right, so we'll just call this a Yamaha 276. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this plugin on this track. So we have that as an insert. So let's get to our quick controls. And now if I go to Yamaha 276, let's see if that. So it doesn't look like that kind of worked as expected. Let me just try it again. I'll save this as a preset again. And See if I move it down to the same insert slot, if that will. So if it's in the same insert slot, you can save it as a preset, it looks like. So give that a shot and yeah, so it looks like it's only in the same insert. Um, I'll see if I can figure out if there's any reasoning for that, but it may be just how it's actually, um, how it's actually kind of seen within the program. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussion. If you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well. Okay, so just see, uh, from Mark Rabin, thanks for all the knowledge, Greg. I get better at Cubase every day because of you and the people here. Uh, I, I really appreciate these lessons and the people here are amazing, grateful. That's great, there, there's incredibly talented people on the live stream that are so helpful with and generous with your time and abilities to help others. That's wonderful.
All right, so we have a question. Is there another way to mono a stereo audio track, not from the pool? Also, can you drop a stereo file on a mono track and have it turn into mono instantly? I think we could do that in Cubase VST. So it's slightly different, but we'll show you one way to do it. Uh, probably maybe the proper way to do it. So let's say if I have this going on that you could just select the stereo track here and go to project and then you could just do convert tracks and you can say multi-channel to mono and that will just make it into two mono tracks for you so again just select go to project and then you can just go to convert tracks All right, wonderful to see Millard Brown on the Hangout. Okay, so I just see uh, probably Taylor, just uh, a clarification on this question of copy A to B, like we used to be able to copy B to add top left and switch between A and B, also top left earlier versions of Cubase Pro. So I think I, think I understand what's going on. And if I remember, this is with Howling and Sonic SE. So let's say if I have this particular sound, Load it up and let's come over here. So I'm gonna say switch to B setting from this little drop down menu. Okay, and now I think we could go to, so if I go to switch to A setting, that goes to copper mine when I want to switch to B setting that point you go to cryptophobia so just this little drop down menu here so let me know so that should be able to kind of take two different states of the plugin and be able to switch back and forth between those All right, uh, so a question from Michael Pierce. Uh, hey Greg, uh, when you copied the automation from the MIDI track to the audio track, how did you quickly move it to the same place in time? So that's uh, just a paste at origin. So let's say if I have just some love, sorry about that. Let me turn that down to kill. Um, Okay, so let's say I have automation here and automation here. So let's say if I, a lot of times when we paste automation, it may just go directly to like where, so if I copy this automation, let me just, if I copy this, uh, and let's say my play position is here and I paste um, that often it it'll paste it based on the cursor position and not necessarily in the same time. So if I wanted this automation to be pasted in the same time, I would just hit like control uh, or command C to copy. And then instead of command C or V, to paste, I would do Alt V, and that would paste it at origin. So you could, and you could do that with most data in. So when you just kind of come over here, you just go to, you know, there's cut, copy, paste, and then there's also just kind of a paste uh, at origin, paste time at origin. So just do Alt or Option plus V. So if I wanted to, and that will paste it at the same exact time. So I select this, so copy it normally, Control, Command, C. So if I do, if I come here and paste, it's gonna paste it based on a cursor position, but if I wanted to take that same data 
and have it at the same time. So copy, normal copy, but just Alt V. Um, so we'll come here and then that will paste it at the same time. And that's a paste at origin. So instead of Control V or Command V, just use Alt or Option V. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Uh, so I see a question. Uh, Hi, Greg. I was importing tracks from one project to another, but at the point where you choose which tracks to import, the arranger track wasn't showing in the import list. Have I just missed something? So that's one of the things that generally is kind of a project specific thing. So you, I don't think that it shows up in um, for importing. So I'll just try it again here. So let's say if, if I go to import uh, tracks from projects, since you know you're probably not going to take a a project uh, back and forth between them. So let's say if I'm here, I think this project has uh, an arranger track in it. So when I come here, um, we're not going to see the arranger track, I don't believe. But let me try one other thing that may help with it. So let's say if I See if I have it there, it doesn't look like it. So let's say, okay, so I have an arranger track in this particular project. Okay, I'm gonna see, I'm not sure if this works either, but let's see if we export selected tracks. Um, Okay, so I'll just call this arranger. Yeah, so it doesn't like the, so it seems like the arranger track might be specific to that particular project. Um, and I can see where, you know, it may not make sense to, um, you know, to drag it over. Let me just see if I take Let's see if I have an arranger track in this project here. Try one more thing. Okay, so what you could do, um, worst case scenario, and I realize this isn't like the best. If you have two projects open, you could drag the arranger data from one project from an inactive project into an active project but you know it's one of those things that could be a bit more um project centric where you may not need to arrange it so much so but maybe you could try that and see if that helps All right, so I think we got the the right macro for Alex Morgan, so. And that was with the mute uh, events on the selected channel, so hopefully that works for you, Alex. Thanks for writing. Okay, so I see from uh, Sven Isaacson, uh, I started teaching a friend who's new to Cubase, who is a new Cubase Pro user, so that's great to we're glad that your friend has found the light. Uh, it has given me a new appreciation for what Greg does. It's uh, not easy to answer all our crazy questions on the fly. It's impressive. So maybe I'm just an idiot savant. So, but thank you for the kind words, Sven. Okay.
Okay, so I, I think uh, I just see um, 16,384. Is that a random number or is he just pulling it out of his butt? Um, so I think that is the actual value. So I think it's once you start doing... Uh, and we'll see if I if my memory is correct here. Uh, I'll just pull up a calculator just because MIDI is always kind of binary information and there's 128 values okay so let's say if i just wanted to so i think it's going to be just maybe 128 times 128 so 128 times 128 is 16,384 so that's how they come up with the values for pitch bend so All right, so we have a question uh, from Matt Smith. Uh, if I've used a tempo track in musical mode to change the tempo of my audio and I want to send all my files to someone for mixing, will that actual audio file be changed already or do I need to create some sort of bounce? Okay, so what you would need to do is, let's say, uh, if all of these tracks are in musical mode, so I will just come here, play this quickly and I'll revert the project because I probably destroyed it pretty well. Okay, so if you're changing the tempos and you want to pass it on to someone else, uh, let's just see. So let's say, So what you would need to do is to pass on the files to someone else is, you know, once you're kind of in the sample editor, so let's say if I'm here, um, you could just go to process and just choose flatten files. And then that will automatically um, be written as new files at the new information. So I'll take the audio that's being changed during playback and during playback, it will then be written as the file at the new tempo that you've chosen. So try that, Matt. Okay, so we see Mr. Daniels checking in on the live stream. He says, hello there, first time talking to you. How's everything? So I think everything is doing great. So enjoying, always enjoying doing these uh, live streams, helping out people. All right, and my chat field jumped on me, so... Okay, just reading through more comments. Uh, okay, so we have Prince from Zambia. Says, I love this, I need to know more. So thanks for joining us. All right, so Mr. Daniel just says, I don't have Cubase, but I have FL Studio 20 trial version, but still love your work though. I'm also interested in making music, so this is why I'm here for this awesome stream. So yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. And you know, you could always start off with Cubase elements and kind of build up from there. So, but we're glad you're enjoying the live stream.
So as you see from Mark Rabin, uh, 16,384 is actually an important number to know because uh, this is actually a number that occurs in expression bin per... Uh, if this is the case, Greg, I'm totally floored by your knowledge and how much I do not know. So yeah, it's just, you know, pitch bend was always tricky because you had 16, you, know, you have 8,192 values up and 8,192 values down. And if your pitch bend was set to one semitone, you had 8,192 divisions per semitone. Or if it was set for an octave, you have 8,192 divisions up or down but stretched over an octave. So that's why, you know, in Cubase 11, you could have that, the grid that was associated with the semitone so that you could act, you know, because a lot of people would do like very extensive programming with pitch bend. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, you just are, you know, one, one value out of 16,384 flat. And it's like, why is something not sound right? Why is it? And it's just because, you didn't really zoom in, you know, microscopically in a very granular level to make sure that the pitch bend reset correctly. So, and I think that's really the only MIDI, you know, technically MIDI pitch bend isn't a MIDI CC message. It's a MIDI system common message. And, you know, but most of the our MIDI CCs just go from 0 to 128 or 0 to 127 rather. So... Okay, so we just see uh, Jason from uh, in York, UK, about speeding up the tempo of the audio track. So, you know, one of the things that you do, and we, we showed it a little bit earlier, but if you need it to, you know, just place the tracks into musical mode, and you could do that in the pool or just by selecting multiple tracks and selecting musical mode. And as we listen to it here, whatever tempo you type in once it's in musical mode, So want to be 140 or 88 the, all the vocals the audio will all just kind of automatically lock to the tempo just kind of be stuck to the tempo Okay, so we have a question. How can we select a MIDI note by velocity? Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to come here and... You could do this in the logical editor. So if you wanted to select a note, you know, that has a velocity of. Okay, so let's say these red nodes have a velocity probably of 100, <clears throat> I think. Okay, so now let's say these notes so the the notes in red have a velocity of 100, basically, except for this one particular note. So if I wanted to select all notes that had a velocity of 100, I could go to my logical editor, and let's go ahead and we'll, we're gonna choose select notes, and we're gonna say value two, um, which is velocity, we're gonna say is equal to 100. So now I'm gonna say apply, and it's gonna select every single note that had a velocity of 100. I could also say 
select every note that was less or equal to 100. So let's say if I had adjusted a couple of velocities up, I could now just come over here and that would select every note that was equal to 100 in velocity or less. So we can set up conditions like that quite easily uh, inside of the uh, directly from the logical editor. So choose select, type is equal to notes, value two, which will then is the velocity, is the value two of a MIDI note message less or equal than whatever value you want. Okay, so sub 403 wants everyone to hit the like button, so I won't disagree. Okay, so I see uh, greetings, uh, Luke here from uh, Basel, Switzerland. Uh, maybe you could explain why we could say physical inputs and outputs, but not external inserts. Would be nice to know why that is a problem. Thank you. So you can't necessarily save the external uh, outputs, but what you can do, uh, and I've I've asked for this repeatedly, uh, but once you have your external effects set up. Um, and let's say, okay, this is going to be connected into these inputs here is just click on add favorites. Okay. So at this point, um, if I have nothing selected here, so let's say if I remove this, You know, just try to go here and say, okay, I want to go to my distressor. Uh, and then you could just, I, you know, and if you have this saved, so let's say if I have this and I'm just going to add this. Okay, so I will select this, click on favorites. Okay, and now that the routing is gonna be preserved. So just add it as a favorite. So I'm not sure why you, it can't necessarily be added, but just try to add it as a favorite and then you could just call it up when you need it. Okay, so we have a question uh, dealing with expression maps. What is the difference between an attribute and direction in expression map? Um, I get it mixed up between the two of them. But one of them is going to be on a note by note basis, um, and I believe that's an attribute. But I I tend to get these I, I tend to get these not recalled correctly. And the other one is going to be will stick uh, will maintain the current value until it's changed. So that's kind of the difference between the attribute and direction. So if I told you which one was which, I would be you know. 50% uh, chance of getting it wrong. Uh, but one of them is going to be for the actual note, and one will be, I, and I believe that's an attribute, but again, I could be mistaken. And direction, I think, will maintain that setting until another expression comes in.
right? So we see some people asking about Ambient Dave, who used to attend the live streams here. So if anyone talks to him, just uh, let us know, pass on our best to him. So. Okay, so we see uh, from sub403 says changing MIDI to chord pad fixed my issue. So that's great. Thanks for letting us know. Okay, so I just see uh, from Diego, uh, hi Greg, just purchased an M1 Mac, just wondering uh, uh, how it works with integration with Cubase 11 thing. So I think in the next couple, pretty imminently, um, we'll see an update that will have some more advanced uh, Rosetta support for M1 Mac. So there's a lot of people that are running it now without any problems and we'll see more capabilities. Um, coming, you know, really soon. Okay, so I just see, uh, and this might be from Pablo with, uh, with the automation for, uh, with the render in place with automation. So, and you just mentioned it might be with MIDI. So let's go ahead and test that quickly and see if it makes a difference. Okay, I'm just gonna revert this project. Okay, so we have our MIDI being routed out to Groove Agent here. Okay, so now we'll listen to it. Okay, so I'm going to select the event. I'll just choose complete signal path. And it looks like it's carried over the volume automation here as well. So we'll sell that track. We can see visually that the automation for the track is kind of carried over. I'll start to get loud. Stop. Okay, so just see a nice comment from uh, Sound Blanky. Greg, many thanks for these Cubase Pro, uh, Cubase Pro 11 user here. These sessions are pure gold. And also a comment from Mule Raven. Um, greeting from Ireland. We've just finished producing our first self written album, learned a ton from Cubase during that period. So that's great. Congratulations on the album. It's a, it's a big accomplishment. So it's hard to finish a record. So. Right, so we see Michael Teams wants people to slam the like button, so.
Okay, so we have a question from sub403. How do you set chord pads to a specific key? So when you get to the chord pads, you'll have different presets. Um, so, and then as soon as you do this, you'll see lots of different keys. So you can say major scale, you know, E, F sharp. So say, okay, I want a major scale and F. And then you'll have minor scales as well. So now we could just come directly over here. Let's say, okay, let's go to my roads. And now we could just trigger the particular. So, but that's all you have to do is just kind of click right here. And then there's lots of presets for all your major and minor keys and other chord progressions right there. Okay, so we have a question from uh, JVI. I have a song with huge variations in tempo, so large that uh, made a MIDI track, tapped all the quarter notes, enabled toggle time-based, and under MIDI functions merge tempo from tapping. Uh, when I turned on the tempo track, this all works, but the tempo fluctuates a lot. Now I want to flatten the tempo to one speed. How can I do this? All right, so we'll show you kind of the same concepts here. I have a good multi-track file to show this, but I can't play it on YouTube for copyright reasons. But if you get to see me do a, a, a live presentation, it's not going to be broadcast. Um, it, it's pretty cool, but the principle will be the same. So when I come here and let me just fix my connections quickly here. So I'll just... Okay, so let's say I'm doing this and I have created a tempo map. So I'll just do this here with, by not opening the project logical editor, but choosing tempo detection instead. So I'll say analyze. So we have fluctuating tempo now. So if you're project is following tempo fluctuations um, and it's let's say a multi-track project select all the audio tracks so just select them and then go to audio and this works in the same as the stereo track or multi-track go to advanced and choose set definition from tempo and what this will do and you could save this in the project or within the audio files doesn't matter this now embeds all these tempo changes. And if you have a lot of tracks, it may just take, you know, 20 seconds or so. And it's basically embedding the tempo changes of all of these tracks uh, as metadata in the timestamp for the audio file. So when you come here, we see my tempo fluctuating. But let's say I want this to be a perfect 144 beats a minute. I deactivate my tempo track and just type in 144. And now it's playing back a perfectly steady tempo without fluctuations. If I wanted to follow the original tempo track, now I want it to be a perfect steady 144 beats a minute. Now, one other trick that you could do if you have the tempo information is you could also just select the tempo track itself. And if you go to the 
to the center right edge, you could just kind of regulate the tempo. So if you wanted it to be not perfectly steady, but to be a little more in line, you could compress or expand the tempo fluctuations directly here. So if you want to, you know, if it seems a little mechanical, it's like, you know, instead of making it perfect, just maybe try um, taking those fluctuations and minimizing the range of the fluctuations and see how that works. All right, so we had another question on a control room function, so we covered that a little earlier. All right, and we're also seeing uh, some links to the Cubase Nation Discord. So all sorts of wonderful information in there. We see Gareth giving Jan a big shout out of kudos for the cubaseindex.com. All right, so we see Matt from London. Uh, great hangout. Really appreciate your hard work with and the great questions from the fellow cubasers from Matt in London. Thanks for your kind words. Okay, so we have a question from Mark Rabin. I uh, got a question that might be redundant. Uh, would you explain to us the advantages, disadvantages of two similar ways of doing something like parts, events, or musical clock mode, something like that? So often... Um, just show you like parts versus events so some of these can be like parts and events is an example of maybe something that was more of a legacy approach to doing audio uh, or more of a legacy approach from early cubase versions that some people you know be, become very ingrained in their workflows um so let's say if I have like multiple parts that are kind of comped together. Um, if I take all of these events here and I'm just gonna turn these into parts. Okay, so now let's see when I come here and we go to the part editor. Um, so this is how a lot of people would choose to do comping in pre kind of before we had our comping editor. I'll just turn off my snap. Um, and then you could just activate, you know, different comping here. So a lot of people will still that I know still kind of comp this way and they kind of manually say okay i wanted to mute that part and unmute this and so the part editor we could think of it is often used as kind of a separate uh editor all these events are kind of on the same track but here if we want it to say okay i want this one to play to here and i want this to you know so we could choose kind of different parts so you could think of it as a bigger comping editor most people since the comping functionality came i think in cuba 6 uh tend not to use the part editor as much but there's still some people that are kind of very ingrained with its workflow and uh their part of the question was uh musical mode versus clock mode for two different events. Okay, so let's say uh, I will do this with showing video.
Okay. And let's say if I have a specific uh, cue that I want it, and this could work for MIDI and audio. So let's say like that cloud. So what I want to do is to actually come to this particular where that cloud is coming in. Okay, and I just wanted to, let's find a symbol. Okay, so let's say. Okay, so I want that particular note to be synchronized with the cloud. So I'm gonna just place this into a quick record. Okay, so roughly when I go, let's say into edit mode, I want this note, not necessarily to be locked to the bar and beat, but to locked to that event in time when the note, so as we do this, I want that to be locked to the visual cue in time. So let's say maybe I wanted to start a little earlier. So I'm gonna place this transport into use video falls edit mode. So now, as soon as we do that, I can move the note around and as the note is moved, um, we can see that the video will kind of update frame by frame. So now we look at this. Okay, so, but let's say I need to change the tempo. So when this particular track is in musical mode, let's say I go from 120 beats a minute to 99 beats a minute. So now we're gonna hear that cymbal crash come in. But it's not timed to that other cloud. So what we need to do, if I wanted that to remain at the same time, where as we play, so I would place this into linear mode where we see the clock. So now I could adjust the tempo of the project and the project will play slower, but that cymbal crash will still come in synchronized with the cloud. So that way, this is going to be based on the time position and not going to be affected by tempo changes because it's always going to occur at this moment in time versus measure a 10 beat 3 clock pulse 4. Um, that could fluctuate varying on the tempo. So once we see in musical mode, those tracks will speed up and slow down based on the tempo adjustments. If it's in clock mode, those events are tied to the time position as opposed to the actual bar and beat. So those, those are some of the differences between those two, Mark. See, Gareth is mentioning there needs to be a Cubase ping pong thread on Discord for the gamers. So, Okay, so we have a question. Um, I've imported a couple of .wav files into a project. They disappear after some time and I have to import them again. Any ideas what happens? If so, where do they go? How can I relocate them? 
So, you know, generally Cubase won't erase tracks, uh, WAV files that are imported. I see sometimes people will right click and choose to remove a track or, you know, if something is, let's say I have this selected and I have this selected and I think I'm deleting one and they're both selected and they both get deleted. If you do have a WAV file that's been deleted from your project, uh, it will be present if you go to your media, to your pool window. Uh, so any of your audio files that are in your project will be there and then you could just drag and drop it uh, to like a WAV file again. So I could just go directly from my pool window and once we have those, you could just kind of drag and drop uh, from the pool window or import into project. Uh, so that, so, but generally, you know, Cubase won't, um, just, just del delete the files for you. All right. So we see, uh, David and Kristen from Nashville are checking in. So it says he loves a photo. I, I put a photo of my son playing bass on Facebook for his birthday last week. So they, they liked that photo. So thank you for the kind words. I hope you and your family are doing well and that Kristen's doing great as, as well. Missing you guys in Nashville. Okay. Um, I see a question. Every time I click anywhere in the arrange window or a part in the arrange window, the auto scroll gets activated. Uh, very frustrating and need to keep hitting F to deactivate. Uh, how can I fix this? All right, so let's say I have, uh, I'll just do it on our project here quickly. Okay, and I'll just kind of blow this up. So it's a, I have auto scroll turned off. So when you get to the end of this screen, it's not gonna follow. All right, and I'm just gonna check one preference. All right, so. All right, so there may be one preference that may be affecting this. Um, let me see if it's maybe under transport. Maybe locate when clicked in empty space. Doesn't seem to turn on the auto scroll, but maybe this is when I click anywhere in the arrange window or part in the arrange window, the auto scroll gets activated. Very frustrating, you need to keep hitting F to deactivate. So check that one preference and see if that is affecting it. So just locate when clicked in empty space and see if that is, is making a difference. Okay, so Michael Teams, uh, like, 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 whack the like button with six thumbs up. That sounds pretty compelling. So since we're at 98, if we get two more people to hit the like button that haven't yet, that'd be great. We can get 100. So thank you, Michael. Okay, so I just see uh, follow-up, sorry, I was a bit vague about the routing. The audio connections isn't the problem, it's the mixer I.O. configuring that's the tedious part. 
Okay, so let's say if we come here, let's do a new empty project. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone's learned something new. Okay, so I'll just go to my audio connections and let's say I have 16 mono ins. And let's make it 16 mono tracks. All right, so we come here, we have mono in one, two, so they're all set to mono in. And I've had kind of inconsistent behavior with this, so. Let's see if I hold down. So now when I come here, um, I just held down the shift key. So now track one is mono in one, two, three, four, five, six. So it, it automatically incremented the routing. So that way, you know, I could just take, select the 16 tracks, hold down the shift key and set one, and then it will increment and kind of, you know, automatically increment to the next input for the next channel. So let me know if that helps. Okay, so I just see question, hi, how to how make MIDI learning to MIDI keys? Um, so I'm not sure if, the, if you want to like trigger MIDI keys for particular functions um, and to learn that, but if that's the case, sorry if I don't understand a question, but if you go to like the generic remote, I could say, we're gonna do a MIDI note on message and I'm just gonna hit a note and I learned, I click on learn for this function and I could say, okay, I want it to go to, um, you know, to open up mixer. So let's say I wanna to go to command and let's go to devices and I just want to open up um, mixer. So now when I hit this MIDI note, it will open up the mixer. So I do this, the mixer is open, the mixer is closed. So, but if maybe if you could rephrase the question of how make MIDI learning MIDI keys, but that way you could do a MIDI key, learn, learn a MIDI key to do different functions. Okay, we have a question. Hello, can you please explain what is the best way to pitch a instrumental sample an octave up or down and stay in time with the sample project? Time stretch, thank you. Okay, so one easy way of doing it, let's say if I have just a sampler track, um, there's a couple of different ways to approach this. And I think, let's say if I have Okay, so now if I wanted to come here, I could say create sampler track. All right, and now that I've done that, I'll just choose kind of the start position here. And let's go ahead and now. Now let's, let me just see if I get this to. Just get this. Now you may notice that as I play the sample, that the higher notes play back. If 
faster than the other notes. So they're, if they're playing back at different lengths, but in the sample editor, all you have to do is just put it into audio warp. Now they're all playing back at the same pitch. And if I wanted to do this also, I could show this with maybe a quick drum beat. So now I have a sampler track. I can So I play higher, but it'll play faster. But if I put on audio warp, it'll play back the same tempo, but at different pitches. And this is helpful if you have like maybe a quick vocal type of function as well. I could just say, let's create a sampler track. So if I played back a chord, they would all play back at different speeds, but now I could come over here to audio warp and, and just play chords. And now, even though they're different pitches, you could do that. Now, if we wanted to do this more on the project window, let's just jump back to, let's say, Okay, so let's say if we play back this project here, this drum loop. Now we could go to audio, and then if you wanted to just do pitch shifting, and let's say if I just, we'll just transpose it. Say down. So at this point, I'll just apply that pitch shift to the file. So now if we undo that, but when we go to the process, we will say pitch shift, but I have time correction here. So if I go down an octave and now we listen to it, That's going to slow it down. But if I come here and just choose to have time correction, that will keep the same time regardless of the pitch shifting. So there's kind of a couple different ways to approach that. So you could do it from the sample track or just an offline process with the pitch shifting and enable time correction. All right, wonderful to see Jeff Zabelski is able to join us from uh, Chico, California. Okay, so I uh, just see a question uh, about MIDI learning on Cubasis 3 on iOS. So I don't have the ability to show uh, Cubasis on iOS during the live stream, but if you want to email me I, at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could probably get an answer for you. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, when I render a certain event, the outcome result starts and ends same as the original event. How can I get it from the beginning to the end of the project? Okay, so let's say if we have an event here um, and you want it to fit maybe the beginning and the end of the project, so if you wanted to take this event and have it automatically rendered, but silence at the beginning. So if you do a render in place, that's gonna render the particular event, I believe. So, but let me just check. Um, yeah, because you're just rendering that particular event. But if we choose to come over here and do an export audio mix down, uh, I could 
come right over here. So I say, okay, I'm, I'll just solo this particular track and I will do an export audio mix down. And let's add that to the queue. So now, and I will choose to add an audio track with the result. So we'll just say, uh, create an audio track, start queue export. So now we should have an audio file that will be, uh, sorry, that was selected. I'll do it one more time without it being monitored. So say start queue export, give it a second. And now we'll have one audio file that will be kind of the length of the project. I have it set for a different sample rate, uh, but it will be the length of the project and we'll just have silence at the beginning and end. So, but if you do a render in place, um, I'll try just a quick render in place with just a track, but that will just render that only that particular section. So if you want it to, um, to do it, I'll try to render a place one more time. All right, so we'll do this one event and keep the source tracks unchanged. Yeah, so the render in place will you know, maintain the same length, but if you want it to have it be silent at the beginning and the end, just do an export audio mix down. Um, all right. So from Jeff Zavalski, uh, a reel to reel tape, I captured a 90 minute, uh, stereo track of the Moog type synthesizer, the PA, the Paya from decades earlier, best for samples to capture the sample for Halion, uh, capture and splice with Cubase or Wavelab first. You know, what I would probably do is, you know, I would maybe do it in Cubase because this will give you some flexibility. Um, let's see, I may have a project that might show this. Okay, so let's say I have, um, my Halion loaded up here. Okay, so we could just come over here. So I could, let's say if I wanted to sample a particular instrument, let's say, okay, I wanted to take this so anything you, you could just have that audio file um and then have that be the side chain input and then just sample and the beautiful thing of halion is you can sample directly into it so i will just kind of come let's see if i remember how to do this it's been a while But as soon as you get to the sample recorder, I could now just come over here and you just kind of click here. And then as you're playing, and then you can just create your own kind of sampled instruments very quickly, just side chaining it directly into Howling. And so I would, if that makes sense for kind of your sample process, you could just, you know, play the little section instead of having to cut everything manually. And if you wanted to just sample, that will capture not only the MIDI note on, but the MIDI note off. So this, you know, so you could just sample directly in just by the sidechain input in Halion.
Okay, so let's say... Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to jump straight into the full MIDI screen window? It now opens in the bottom of the screen and hard to see a lot of MIDI notes. So it's just a preference. So if you come to preferences and under editors, we could say double click instead of opens into lower zone, opens into window. So now we could just double click and it's its own full screen window. So once again, go to your Cubase preferences, uh, select editors and double click opens into editor in window. So now if I wanted to go back to the default behavior, I could just double click and it's right there in uh, the lower zone or it could be a, 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 a um, dedicated independent window. Okay, so we have a question. Um, if I want to apply the Yamaha reverb or the compressor from my UR824 after having recorded, how would I do this? I know I can use them during recording for my QMix. Uh, can I do it after too? So there is kind of a way of setting up an effects return bus, um, but it, it's actually hard to get it to do anything other than kind of playback live and it's not rendered. Once you have the plugins that come uh, as a DSP that comes with uh, the UR interfaces, for instance, and that would be like the Morphing Channel Strip or the RevX Reverb, if you wanted to use those, you know, with your Cubate, with the UR uh, 824, that's what you have. Um, you know, you have the license, you'll have a license code on a sheet of paper for the actual plugins and they could run natively. So when you wanted to add an effects channel track, um, you could just say, I wanted to go to the reverb. And if you want to use like the RevX plate, these will just show up as native based plugins that you could use during the mix down process. So not only during recording where it's utilizing the onboard DSP, but also you could have these as native software plugins with the same exact sound and same algorithms uh, just being hosted by your computer CPU. Okay, so we have a question. How can I preview samples in the media bay with the headphones via control room with Sonarworks Sound D while the monitor output is routed to my monitors? Uh, unfortunately, in this setting, I can only preview samples via the media bay with the monitor mix. Um, so if you, what you have to do is once you have a phones set up, so let's say we go to our audio connections uh, and go to your control rooms and make sure that you have a phones channel and it will be one of the things that you could add a phones channel. So while your audio is being sent out to your monitors um, and you want it to preview with the headphones, go to the preferences and under control room, you can say use phones channel as preview channel. So that way the audio can still be going directly out to your monitors playing. And then you could audition different loops or different sound effects using the phones channel. So just make sure again under preferences to control room that you have use phones channel as the preview channel. And then I think that will do the trick for you.
Okay, we see from Michael Pierce, uh, I've had so many workarounds in my workflow to paste uh, at the same point, but never investigated anything else. Pasted origin it is. So yeah, once you know that, that's, you're now a power user officially, Michael. Once you start doing that, you'll just feel like you know a trick that no one else does. Don't tell anyone. Okay, so you see a question. Hi, Greg. How do I load a personal HRTF SOFA file in the Ambi decoder? Uh, how do I set it up? Um, how do I set up Cubase Pro for making a binaural stereo file from the Ambisonic 4-track recording? So I think you need the plugin. Um, to. If, I think the personal HRTF is like where it takes the profile of your ear. So I think you just need... Uh, that particular plugin from the company um, to do that. So let me just uh, go to the download assistant. And I think this is sold separately. And But I think it's a third-party solution. I haven't done this yet. Um, I tried to take a picture of my ear, and I just had really bad luck with it. But I'll, maybe I'll try to get it for Friday's live stream and show it a little more in depth. But let me just. But I think you will need the third party utility for that. And I think you find it the uh, immerse with uh, VST Ambit decoder. So that's the little utility program that you would need to load the HRTF file, I believe. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to use more than one audio interface in Cubase? Um, so on the Mac side, you could use part of the core audio system. Is uh, So if you go to the audio MIDI setup, you could create an aggregate device. Um, sometimes it will compound latency. Uh, on the Windows side, some people unsatisfyingly can use the ASIO for all. And the problem gets to be is, you know, a lot of people think, okay, I'll just get a bunch of, you know, inexpensive two in, two out interfaces like USB interfaces. But every time you do that, it can compound the latency, but the t interfaces are never truly locked together. And as Cubase is sending out information so that it's playing back correctly, you know, if the devices aren't clocked together, um, it makes it like really hard to play back audio in a mix accurately. So that's why you see a lot of, you know, companies don't really utilize multiple interfaces and either you could use an interface with the appropriate IO configuration or, you know, some people use, you know, Firewire interfaces uh, directly for this purpose. Or some people will use, you know, um, Thunderbolt interfaces where you could stack. But most people currently are running USB uh, interfaces for their audio and they don't have the ability to stack multiple units together. So... See real ravens laughing. That I referred to myself as an idiot savant. But if you saw me try to run Excel, I'm, I'm a total Excel moron. Um, I'm just horrible at it. Uh, so just see, he says, uh, Greg, I think you're way more talented than that. I hope you're getting plenty of time for producing, mixing as well. I suspect you do a lot of that uh, to get that kind of experience. So I, I don't work on too many personal projects. You know, it's work has been 
very busy doing live streams and lots of demos. So, uh, but I've been playing bass on some of the projects for some of the members of the live stream here with Michael Teams and Pablo and Gareth. So that's been a lot of fun just to be kind of a bass player. So. Okay, uh, so I see a question from Tom. God, I do have a nice melody song converted to MIDI. How to find chords automatically? So, you know, there really isn't, uh, you know, the, there's probably a lot of bad solutions for coming up with chords for a melody, you know, and any melody that you have, you know, you could, you know, if you have, let's say, a four tone chord, you know, that may not make any sense for the, you know, I think that automatic capabilities are, are pretty limited. Um, so there, there isn't really a function in Cubase to do that. So you may just have to kind of play the chords or utilize, you know, the chord pads and try out different ideas. So, but there isn't a way to automatically generate a song based on with a chord progression based on the melodies. But you know, using the chord track and chord pads, there's a lot of great functionality that can help you if those aren't your strong skill sets. Okay. So question, can you show exactly how to activate MIDI ports for outputs? I'm using a Motu MIDI Express rack and the MIDI inputs are working fine, but no outputs can be activated. Okay, so you when you go to, let's say, your studio setup and your MIDI port setup, uh, it may just say inactive because there's nothing on the output ports that is set up. So now if I see inactive... So it's, it's still available to use. So let's say if I add a MIDI track as opposed to an audio track, all right? So I, I, I add a MIDI track here and then I route this out to my Steinberg UR24C port. Now I go to the studio menu to studio setup and it's active because it's actively being used in the project. So just because it says inactive here in the status, or in a state doesn't mean that it's not working. It's just that there's no track that's being sent information out to that MIDI port. So if I changed the MIDI port here, so we see that my UR24C port one is active now, just because there's a MIDI track that's actively using that. So if I choose a different Halion port, we go back to my studio setup window, we look, it's now inactive. I have a MIDI track that's routed to it, then that port becomes active again. So there's nothing special you got to do once the drivers are installed, just add a MIDI track and use the outputs and send it, send MIDI out to that and you should be all set. Okay, my chat field jumped on me. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone's learned something new. All right, just let me find my spot where I was. Okay, so we have a question, uh, external controller. If I use divide track list and put in audio MIDI tracks there, they appear in the mixer counted. So are my, um, so are in my control faders, can I exclude those tracks? Okay, so. 
Okay, so let's say I want to do a divide track list. So we'll activate the divide track list here. Okay, and let's say if I want my MIDI tracks here, let's say my Halion, a Halion Sonic SE. All right, so we can see these still in my mix console and let's add a couple of audio tracks to the bottom. Okay. Okay, so um, so it says if I use divide track list and put audio MIDI tracks there, they appear in the mixer uh, counted. So uh, are in my MIDI control faders. Can I exclude those tracks? Um, so if you want to, I guess if you wanted to not see um, these tracks in the mix console, so let's come over here to visibility. So let's say, okay, so I think if we hide them here, so let's say if I go to my main mix console, F3. You know, I can hide them in the main mix console and still have them visibly there. So you could kind of treat the, let me just see if there's, So you could do it in the main mix console, but this would be synced, I believe, by choice. So but you're going to your F3, you could have those hidden there in the mix console. So if you work with the independent mixer, I don't think it's a problem. But let me know if I'm misunderstanding. Okay. Okay, so we just see from uh, Pedro Webb, thanks for answering basic as well as more advanced questions. I'm new to Cubase, so appreciate it. That's great. We try to answer any questions and sometimes what's a advanced question for some is a really simple and what's a simple question for some is really advanced. So it, th that's why I like a kind of about this format of, of these live streams is, you know, I think, you know, most people, including myself, will learn something new uh, on every hangout, whether you intend to or not. Um, okay. So I just see from Sven Isaacson, uh, do you know if the longstanding Yukon visibility bug will be fixed in the forthcoming update? You mentioned the last hangout or will be neglected again. It was six plus years. We were first promised to fix realize that you know during those six years that there's a lot of changes that have gone on with Yukon as well so um, but I know I'm pretty sure that there are some Yukon enhancements that have been announced uh, and look for that very soon so I say so I just see a question uh, just just bought the software it's amazing can finally make the music I want that's wonderful and we look forward to you know send us a link to some of the music you create uh, you can send me a link at uh, Stein, club Cubase at steinberg.de and we appreciate you being on the live stream. All right, so we see uh, Jay Yarbrough, Yarbrough Music. Hi, Greg. I've been a Cubase artist user for 15 years, just upgraded to pro, super happy. Now I can get the full value of these excellent live streams. So that's great. And for those other people that have like maybe a Cubase Elements or Cubase Artist version, you could definitely take advantage. I think it's 40% off uh, of the upgrade price. So going from a smaller version, like 
you know, AI elements, artists to pro, it's a great time to kind of jump up a level with the current promotion that's going on. Okay, so we just see uh, any tidbits on the new stuff coming to Cubase. So I'm sure that the developers are working on stuff and generally I, you know, <clears throat> will be under if I knew of anything, which I a lot of times don't until very much before you guys do. Uh, but many times I would be under an, a non-disclosure agreement that I couldn't really talk about. So I'm not the person to figure that out from. See a nice comment uh, from Mark Raven. Thanks, Greg. It's almost comical how much I do not know that you do. I'm sure you know lots of stuff I don't as well. So, but thank you for the kind words. And if anything, I just made mistakes before other people and try to learn from them. So. Uh, so just see, hello, Greg, any chance to have disabled option working with effects and group channels? So let's go ahead and just take a quick look. So say if I add an effects channel here and let's go ahead and just add like reverence convolution reverb and I will add a group channel with a series of plugins. Let's make it a stereo group. And in the inserts here, I'll just drop some plugins. Okay, so let's see. So often with these, um, you know, you could choose to disable, you know, you could choose to disable the actual plugins themselves. So let's say if I wanted to jump to the inserts here, we could choose to disable you know the plugins themselves but not the tracks so if you wanted to you know just turn those on and off there you know we could choose to you know free up the cpu resources that way because you may want to disable independent plugins versus the entire track. So you still kind of get there in the same, you still get to the end zone in the same way. Okay, so we see a question. Um, how can I select the highest note by velocity? So if you wanted to select the note that had the highest velocity value, so let's go ahead and just take a look. Um, all right, so let's say I had, okay, so if I wanted to do that, if that's what the question is, we could go to the logical editor, let's choose select. Um, type is equal to note and we want property, I think it's set to, it might not be property, but let's context variable is equal to highest velocity. And now I could just come right over there. And now that note with the highest velocity that we see in red is selected. So once again, select, type is equal to note, context variable is equal to highest velocity. Okay. 
Okay, so we have question, is there a global swing? All right, so let's jump back to another project. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. If you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button and that you subscribe to the channel. Okay, so there's a couple ways you could probably do this. Um, so let's say if I have a quick pattern here. So one way would be to just come over here to the MIDI inserts and there's a quantizer plugin and you can see the swing. And another way would be, okay, I wanna take this and let's go over here to quantize and you could say quantize swing. If I just let me, I'll just do something that's really obviously not swung already. So I'll just I'll just put in a couple of. So let's say if I want to just take this and adjust. So you could adjust the swing. Just right there, let's apply the quantize. I think you're here kind of on the bongos, you could do that. Or if you wanted to just say, okay, let's just quantize it straight to without any swing. just come over here let's say if we bypass and then just putting kind of the quantizer on as well just swing so there's a couple different ways to add like a global swing Okay, so we see from uh, Lewis Knudsen, um, for some reason I'm trying to apply reverse processing to a small audio sample and it's not working. Any ideas what my problem may be? So if I wanted to just take this audio file here, so let's say uh, I wanted to just, and I wanted to take just a portion of the file, let's say one measure, so I would just go to processes and reverse. And now we play it. And I'll take off, mute this, and we'll disable. So just, so I'm not sure if you have like the event selected or if you're doing it just from the audio to processes. 
Um, you could also hit F7 and just try to apply the reverse directly there. Now we reversed or reversed. Nope, nope. So you could just do it kind of like that as well as another method. Okay, so question, is there a way to have Cubase transform channel aftertouch into poly aftertouch? I have a Hydra synth which responds to poly but no controller that transmits poly and a bunch of patches with poly. Okay, so let's see if we can figure it out. So let's say, All right, so say we have aftertouch. Um, so let's try transforming. Let me just look at this in the list editor, make sure. Okay, so try this in um, the logical editor. Um, I'll try type is equal to after touch. You want the function to be transform. Type is equal to after touch. Uh, and then you want to transform the aftertouch information into poly pressure. So I think that will do do it for you. So it's not going to do it in real time, but it may not make sense for it to do it in real time. Um, but you could give that a shot. And so, and as we do this, as we add notes in, that's when you can see kind of the aftertouch information showing up here. So, but give that a shot. And once again, that logical editor type is equal to after touch. Uh, we'll say type is set to fixed value, poly pressure. So just give that a try. And I think that will do the trick. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, James here from Pylon. Uh, Greg, what is the lightning icon on top of the left corner of your Cubase? I don't see that on mine, Cubase 10.5. This is just to indicate that this particular project is active. So you may not see that icon appear until a second. Then once a second project is open, you could toggle back and forth as to what is the active or inactive project. So when you see it illuminated in orange, that indicates that that is the active project. So you may not see that icon appear until you open a second project. Uh, then once you have a second project open, you could activate or deactivate a project just by clicking on that icon. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, Greg. Can you explain the best way to set up external effects external effects unit to use send and return in Cubase 11 Pro? I have a Motu Track 16 sound card. 
with external ins and outs. Uh, thanks for your work, priceless info. So all you need to do is go to uh, your audio connections under your studio menu, go to external effects, and let's say I wanted to add an external effect in stereo, and I want this to be, I want this to be my Bricasti reverb, just in case you have one, everyone should. You choose what inputs and outputs it's connected to from your uh, Motu interface. So your track 16, so go to available inputs and outputs. Now, when you want to access that effect, you can come over to the inspector and let's say you go to uh, like the insert on the track. You just come right over here and you'll see it under external effects. And then you could just come right there and that would just carry over and at that point, you could, you'll could you see this measure delay icon. Click there and that will do the delay compensation for you. So define the input and output under the audio connections under the external effects tab. And then when you, it'll just show up as an external effects unit. Okay, so we have a question, a basic question, but I never understood how the pool is managing files. If I import a sample I have on my hard disk, does the sample get copied into the project folder? So it's really a preference. Um, so it, you, sometimes some people may want like all their loops to reside in their loop library. Uh, sometimes you may want any file that's been imported into the project to be reflected in the project folder itself. And it's just a preference that you could set. I think it's under editing audio uh, and on import audio files. Um, you could have copy all files to project folder. So once that's selected, anytime you import a loop, it's automatically gonna be placed into the project audio file folder. If that isn't checked, the loop will be imported and it will be accessed in the project, you'll see in the pool window that loop. Uh, so if you go to your media, you'll see it in the pool window. But you may notice that it may have a different location when you go to the path, that some of these will be in different locations. So the pool can still reference those files, but if you want it to for good audio file house, housekeeping, is probably go to the preferences and editing audio, copy all files to project folder. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, I would like to know in order to eventually erase unused files from the project without losing the original files that are on my hard disk. So once again, uh, once you do that, then all you have to do is just click on remove unused media from the project and then you could have those files. It'll ask you if you wanna remove it from the pool or remove it, move it into the trash and you could choose to how you want, what you want to do with the files. Okay, uh, so we have a question. How to do a tempo change, for instance, slow down in tempo track and keep the ability to alliance new counter melodies to the bar and beat grid? Okay, so I'll just do a quick new project here. Okay, so let's just say. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and add a tempo track. Okay, so I'm gonna activate just a quick um, Just go ahead and paint some notes in here. Okay, so let's say we just have a little horrific composition here. All right, so let's say we just play this in. Okay, so if I just come here, I see I have my, my bar and beat grid and I will come here and let's say I just want to do tempo changes. So as I want to speed up, and slow down. Now, um, so and when so it says uh, slow down in tempo track and keep the ability to alliance new counter melodies to the bars and beat grid. So this way. So if you wanted to have like, you know, your different tempo changes, everything could just be aligned, you know, accordingly, just kind of like that. So let's say if we want to do it faster, so, so tempo slows down. So that's how you do it. And then all the other tracks that you have can follow those tempos just uh, the same way. So, but let me understand, I'm not sure what you mean by the ability to alliance new counter melodies, um, but you could lock the position of those if you wanted to. So if you wanted to lock the position of those events, um, or you could now just, once you have that done, just place that into linear mode as opposed to musical mode, and then you could do other tempo changes. Okay, so I see question, how can we swap a content inside of a project? So I'm not sure if it's swapping like a, an audio file for another audio file, but let's say. So let's say I have this audio file used multiple times in a project, so I'll come here, let's say I'll copy this. And let's say I hate it every time this sound file came up and I wanted to replace it. Um, I could hold down the shift key and drag over a file and, th and this file was used multiple, multiple times. And holding down the shift key and dragging over it says, do you want to modify all events that refer to this material? Say all, and then that will replace it with the new audio file so I could just come here and be able to kind of swap out any of those files just accordingly so if that let me know what you mean but if that's what you mean by swap a content inside a project yeah. I think so but if not if I misunderstood let me know
All right. Uh, so we have a question from Martin Grove from Czech Republic. Uh, please, could you briefly describe how to remotely cooperate on one song with a friend? So what I would probably do is just, I may not have this configured, but uh, go to your VST Transit. See if I remember my password. But uh, just try the VST Transit, and then you could share different uh, projects. I don't have my password memorized for that. Um, but you could just, you know, choose different tracks in your projects and be able to share and collaborate using the VST Transit. All right, uh, so see question, is there a way to send a ping through uh, Cubase to an external MIDI clock to see how much is the delay time and how do you adjust the delay in the Cubase track? Um, so we, you know, I've seen this from other programs people ask this, but we haven't really encountered this so much in Cubase. It, it seems like some Programs may need to adjust the MIDI clock, um, but you know what I know. Some people will do is you know kind of render it as an audio file and measure the distance between the two. But I haven't really had to do that in like twenty years, maybe. Um, but there, you know, what some people, let's say if I do have a MIDI track, um, you know, you could adjust the delay in milliseconds here. So maybe just adjusting those particular parameters, uh, right there, that might be able to just do an adjustment if necessary. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, relatively new to Cubase, I'm using Cubase Elements 11. Is there an easy way to change the general MIDI program sound on a given track? So, you know, if you import a MIDI file, it's generally going to import uh, based on your preferences to like a Halion Sonic SE. So when you go to import MIDI to MIDI file, you'll see destination is Halion Sonic SE multi -timbral, and that will import it into a general MIDI bank. So you'll have an instrument, uh, a bunch, a multi temporal instance of Halion Sonic SE, which will kind of look like this. Once you're here, you could say, okay, I want it a different sound. All you have to do is just drag and then you could replace the sound. So say, oh, I really wanted like a string patch here instead. You can now just come. So that's really all you have to do is your MIDI file, if it's a MIDI file, and here there's all sorts of wonderful sounds that you'll get with, and there's more sounds in the higher end versions, but you have great sounds to work with just within your Howling Sonic SE that you could replace and change.
All right, wonderful to see Tan Mays made our live stream. All right, so a question. Uh, will Steinberg interfaces with DSP offload plugins processing from computer CPU to the interfaces DSP? So you have the DSP that you could run in real time and you could print through, so you could monitor through the, uh, through the reverb plugin, the RevX reverb, but you could also monitor or print through the four guitar amps and the morphing channel strip. So at that point, it's embedded within the file. Uh, for the mixing process, you could have native versions of it. There is kind of a way to add an effects bus and route the audio through it, but and route the audio through the onboard DSP, but it doesn't allow you to render the file. So it, it doesn't really get you too much, but it can play it back through the onboard DSP, but it's not offloading the DSP resources. Okay, so we have a question. Is it possible to change the tempo of one of the tracks separately? So all you have to do is you could have the, you know, the, the tracks here will be global. So let's say if I have uh, my tempo track here, but I could have the tempo track to, you know, basically choose not to follow the timing. So now if I draw in tempo changes, that you'll notice that these will these notes will play back at the same time. So I'll switch to to seconds here, and then as I draw in tempo changes, and this track isn't that the value in seconds here remains the same, but it's not really following the different tempo changes that have been employed. So you see, while it's getting longer the notes are staying to the same position. So you could have the tracks not follow the tempo or you could choose to lock their position if you wanted to, just from the info line. Okay, so we see a question. I really want to get Cubase, but I don't have the money for it. What should I do? So probably, you know, there's throughout the year, there's going to be, and you could always, you know, talk to your dealer. We have a lot of people buy down credit cards and pay for it over time. That's not uncommon. Currently, there's a promotion going on. So if you have like a Cubase Elements, you could jump up to a Cubase Pro you know, for, I think it's 40% off. So that's a pretty good way to save a bunch of money to jump up, you know, so you could start off maybe by an inexpensive copy of Cubase Elements and upgrade to Cubase Artist. And if you don't have enough money for that, upgrade later to Cubase Pro as these, you know, promotions that go on monthly occur, so. Okay, so a question, um, Greg, if I make a custom kit on Groove Agent with my own samples, where should I keep the samples? What if I want to use the kit on another computer? Where will Cubase look for the sample, uh, look for the sample location? All right, so let's say I wanted to come over here. Let's just, Let me just grab a quick audio. Just I'll just add an instrument track. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just gonna record some different audio files here. So it's just kind of punch in, punch out. Okay, so let's say these are all my lovely samples. And now I wanted to drag these onto different pads. Hang on a second. Let me just. All right. So let's say these are my samples that I have, you know, just come right over here is to say export kit with samples and then you could save it anywhere on your system that you want so you could save it to a usb flash drive you could save it to wherever you want and just copy those samples over to a different uh, computer so once you have everything kind of set up just right click export kit with samples and then wherever you save it just open it from your other computer a hard drive cd-rom whatever you want, so. All right, so we just see a question. Uh, will the full stream be available right after the live stream? So yes, it may take about a half hour for YouTube to kind of do all of its stuff and compile all of the uh, you know, like closed captioning information, but yeah, it will be available later tonight and probably about four or five hours after I usually take a break for dinner and then I have to watch the whole live stream again and do the index. We'll have the index for all the topics covered. Okay, so a question I forgot to forgot to ask about using the external effects in stereo or mono or how to switch between the two in my previous question uh, about external effects in Cubase 11 Pro. So if you need to switch between the two, then that's when you could have these set up and your audio connection. So let's say you have your external effects and now you could just kind of can come right over here. You could have your distressor set up and now when you... Um, you know, do your different ex external effects. You could have these all kind of saved as favorites and then just have one favorite configuration as a mono, one favorite configuration as a stereo. All right, so we see a nice comment from Studio123. Thank you so much, Greg. And what state do you want us to erect a statue for you as a token of appreciation? So just be a happy Cubase user, a happy Steinberg customer. That's that's the only, uh, the only gratitude I need. So, and thank you for the kind words. Okay, uh, so we see, hi Greg, when I change the arrangement background color for white, why not keep the gray color events? Okay, so let's say if I'm here and I have this, so let's change the background color. And we could do this under um, color scheme. So let's say our project area background color. So let's say I'll make this so those stay the same colors. It just looks like they're different. So let's say if I change this to 16 and I hit OK. So I'm pretty sure those are staying the same colors, but it may look different because of the background differences.
So um, question, is there any audio interface that takes plug-in processing on the interface's DSP rather than on CPU, like VSTI and effects that are in a project and playing real time because I have audio dropouts in real time? Um, I don't know of any that really do VSTIs in that way. You know, obviously I think like the UADs, you know, Motus and Steinberg interfaces will allow you um, to have processing, but it's not allowing you to take any process, you know, any plug in and just have it work immediately on, th on their DSP. So, um, and if you're having dropouts, you know, really, you know, try to figure it out kind of one by one, because often it could be just one plugin or one preset and one plugin that could be just killing your, your CPU, you know. So if it's a really complex synth patch, you know, sometimes one preset can push you way over the edge and you wouldn't think. Okay, so um, we see a question. Hi, Greg. Is there a way to nudge MIDI parts using the keyboard? Uh, using the mouse is cumbersome. So if you have an actual MIDI event, so let's say if I'm here and I just want it to nudge a part, so let's say I have this, there is a nudge palette that you could open up. Uh, so once you open up the nudge palette, so you can move to the right, to the left. And I think that there's, if you hold down control or command that you could just nudge based on here, the beat, uh, or whatever your snap value is. So if I say, okay, I want to nudge this by bar. So I'm just holding down control and left or right arrow. And I think if we have MIDI data inside of the event, so let's say we'll just make this longer and and let's say I come here and I want to nudge the events, we could do the same thing. So just kind of uh, control or command plus the left and right arrow. And then you could nudge based on kind of your snap value that you have set. That could be seconds, could be beats, could be the quantized value. All right, see a nice comment from Pylon Records. Uh, Greg, you just blew my mind with the video and clocking and tempo thing. Wow, wow, love Cubase. That's great. Okay, we have a question. Uh, what does selecting externally clocked in studio setup do? So when you go to our studio setup, um, some audio interfaces, when you go here, can be externally clocked. And this means that it's looking for the clock from the interface. And generally, this is an interface that's locked to maybe like a master clock, something like a... Like a an, um, an antelope atomic clock or like a, you know, Apogee's Big Ben, or if you have an audio interface, or if you, let's say you have a mic pre that has an ADAT out, you could switch between to have your clock of your audio interface uh, basically synchronized to the clock of your mic pre or the mic pre synchronized so that when you're communicating between the two that they're in sync and that they're not out of time with each other. So if you don't have anything connected digitally to your audio interface, you don't need to activate externally uh, external clocking. So some clocks will have a different sound than others. Uh, they'll be more precise and there can be an audible difference as you're monitoring the audio, which sounds better. Okay. All right, so we see the the incredibly talented Fred Corey has joined us for our live stream. So 
dear my dear friend Fred. So great to see you. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining our live stream. Fred's an incredibly talented composer and and wonderful drummer as well. Look him up. He's done all sorts of amazing things. Hope you and Amy are well, Fred. All right, so we see Martin's joining and is just indicating he just got Cubase Elements. He's stoked. Congratulations on your Cubase Elements. And we hope to see you more on the live streams So as you learn more about it. Okay, so we just see, hi, Greg. Uh, hope you're doing well. Moving to new PC, just from Ace Amadeus. Uh, and I want to know the physical location of my old PC, where my customized presets are located, uh, Groove Agent Kits, customized VST settings. Thank you. So generally, they're going to be, um, if you go to like your media bay, you can come over here to user content. Uh, and then you'll see kind of all these different folders. And if you wanted to just find a folder, you could just click right here and say, you know, reveal and finder or explore. And that will show you the location. One other way to do this quickly, sorry, get out of here, uh, is just to, and that will be incorporated with your profile manager so if you go to edit to your profile manager export your profile from old computer import to new computer All right, so a question from Ace Amadeus. If I upgrade to Cubase 11 from 10.5, uh, will I still be able to open projects in Cubase 10.5? So most of the, you know, most of the projects can freely go back and forth. If it's using something that's very specific to Cubase 11.5 or to Cubase 11, what I would do is just simply save it as a new like Cubase 11 document. Uh, quickly and then you will still have you know I would do save as in the Cubase 11 so you always have kind of a, a you know a Cubase 10.5 version so your 10.5 will load in but if you start doing stuff with like sampler track 2 or using plugins some of those functionalities may not translate back so probably the project will open but you may get some messages saying can't use this plugin in this version, you know, stuff like that. going through more discussion. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a question. Can you show some tips for drums quantize, which is tracked in real time? So I guess this is maybe with uh, audio drums. Uh, so we'll show you some quick audio drums. Take a project that Fred Corey, who's on the live stream, lent me for use in these live streams, much appreciated. So kudos to Fred for that. Okay, so let's say we have our drums here and maybe they're not quite, when we listen to them, 
with the click on, which every drummer hates. Maybe it's not as tight rhythmically. So if you want to come over here, let's say I, what I could do is I'm gonna put all of my, I'm just gonna find some of the rhythmically significant parts and let's go to our hit points. So I'm gonna activate the hit points for let's say my kick. And what I want to do is not to have the tracks that are kind of bleeding through uh, but we could adjust our threshold just to have the kicks. Let's do the same for our snare. So I'm going to come over here and we're going to adjust, find the hit points for where our snare is hitting. Okay, so those are toms that are kind of bleeding through. All right, so we'll have just kind of our snare hits. And on this, we're gonna find, let's say, our hi-hats. And same concept. We just want to find kind of where the hi-hats are coming in. So I'm gonna place all of these into a folder. And now we could activate group, this little icon here for group editing on the folder. So now, as soon as I move one, everything in the folder is gonna be linked together like so. All right, so we're gonna to go to our quantize panel and we can see that up here and we're gonna choose a priority. So I'm gonna say the kick has the highest priority. Uh, my snare is gonna have the second highest priority and let's say our hi-hat will be the third highest priority. So what it's doing now is it's placing slices on each of those, basically placing like markers and what we want to do now is we're going to create uh, the slices. So I'm going to just come right over here. We're going to activate this and we're going to say slice. Okay, so now it's created thousands of little slices and we're going to choose our quantize to be 16th notes. So I'm going to quantize and why we do this and why we do the group editing is because when you have this snare, if you hear the snare in the overheads and in the kick mic bleeding through and the hi-hat mic, the tom mic, and if we move just the snare track without moving those other elements, everything sounds really out of phase and unnatural. So we're gonna quantize now to 16th notes. And as we do this, we may notice that there's lots of little gaps. And at that point, we want to crossfade between those gaps. So as we listen to it now, we can come right over here and. There's a snare fill that was like really rushed. So we'll just come up here and. And now everything is perfectly in time. So that's how you could do some drum quantizing of a live drum part. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how can I make a tape stop effect on Cubase with its built-in plugins? I have Cubase 11 Pro version. So I would definitely kind of check out the, um, let's say one called Loop Mash FX. So I'll go to the mix console and let's go to our master fader. And this will be found under other. You'll see Loop Mash FX. So say we're playing along here. And this will give you all sorts of performance effects. So I'm going to just come up here and just do a. So you want to come over here and do. A... 
so you could set the different rhythmic pulses. So you could do different like tape stop effects, doing stuff like that, just using uh, loop mash FX. All right, uh, we have a question. Uh, hello, Greg, I currently own Cubase 10.5 and I'm planning to upgrade to version 11, but I'm kind of paranoid because I don't know how to migrate the key commands to the new version, please advise. So if you come in, just save your key commands as a preset. So if you just come right over here to key commands, once you have that all set up, um, all you had to do is you know just come right over here and store the key commands. Um, and if you store the key commands, that's automatically, that should automatically just translate directly over to Cubase 11. But like some of the other aspects, if you just come here to your profile manager, this will save your preferences, your key commands, your user defined presets and export that from 10.5 and import that into 11. So no, nothing to be paranoid about. Reading through some comments here. All right, so just see uh, the tech folks at UAD tell me I need to remove and download fresh firmware as Cubase 10.5.3 is still not playing well with Apollo Twin. Uh, any general tips on driver removal and firmware replace? So I don't have a, a UAD Apollo interface, but I think it would just probably be you know the same you know, typical, maybe just the uninstall program that you have on Windows and be able to kind of carry that over and just running the firmware update. So I'm not sure if it's anything that's Cubase specific for that or just kind of their, uh, the typical software maintenance type of stuff that's kind of independent of Cubase as a program. All right, so I see a great comment from Tim Weinheimer. Some really great questions today. Question, uh, questions I, I did not know I wanted to ask. So that's why I, I kind of like this format. Everyone, I think a lot of people can learn stuff from other people's questions. All right, so you just see question using Cubase 11 Pro, the bottom horizontal scroll bar and mix console for some reason is black instead of light gray, making it hard to see against the dark gray background. Anyone seen this before? Um, so I wonder if I'll just do a new project and we'll test something. Let's say I have eight audio tracks. 
And I just want to look at my audio tracks here. So make sure that, you know, you, that you don't. So I've never seen it kind of black. Um, you know, like here, I'm just kind of hovering in this area. You know, if you kind of know to hover in that area and just use your mouse scroll wheel, you should be able to, you know, navigate quite effectively. But, you know, maybe if it's black, it's just that maybe there's not enough channels for it to scroll, perhaps. Um, like now it kind of looks black because there's not enough channels. But if I add another eight tracks, um, we could see the bar now because there's something to scroll, but I haven't seen it turn black. But if you want to send me a screenshot um, at clubcubase at steinberg.de, you'd be happy to take a look at it. All right, so we see Pylon Records is has 10.5 open, is doing all these live as I'm doing it. So it's a good way to learn, hopefully. You can learn all my bad habits. Um, so question is direct offline processing for audio events or can it be used for VST instrument events? I would like to reduce the processing needed for my effects. So, you know, if you turn a instrument in, if you render it in, if you do a render in place to audio, then the audio could be just rendered with the effects. Um, but when you do the render in place for a virtual instrument, um, you could have the effects automatically included as well. So as soon as you come over here and go into, let's say an offline, let's say just a direct offline processing. So if, if the ultimate goal is to save DSP resources, you could do a render in place and choose to, you know, include the complete signal path. So we could think of this as no effects, insert sends or inserts EQs and channel strip sends, you know, and adding the master effects. So that way you could just render it in place and, and you could choose to just disable the MIDI track and that will free up a lot of CPU resources for you. Okay, so we have a question. How and why would you use the IAC driver? Uh, and can you please explain Rewire, please? All right, so Rewire was a communication protocol that was developed uh, originally by Propeller Heads and Steinberg. Uh, and what that allowed you to do is if you had uh, a program, it originally is, came with Rebirth, uh, you know, which was originally like an 808-909 or an 808 and 2303s. Um, and then that came as a way to synchronize the two programs initially so that you could have Rebirth open and Cubase hit play and the two would, would synchronize. It would also allow you to have, and then the second iteration came, I believe, that allowed you to pass audio between, you know, the two programs. And when Reason came out, that allowed you to run the two programs concurrently synchronized together. And that's what rewire does. Now rewire is probably maybe a bit of a dated technology at this point. Um, like I'm not sure it's ever going to work on the M one processors on Apple. So, you know, so, but it is a way for like two programs to synchronize, uh, between each other. But what the IAC is, is an inter application communication, 
So think of it as like a software MIDI cable that could be used to route MIDI from one application into another program. So that's what the IAC driver allows you to do. Okay, so I know we had some questions that were sent in. Let's get to those quickly. Um, okay, so we had a question. How to transform MIDI expression CC11 uh, into MIDI volume CC7 on input? Um, so this could be done with the input transformer. So when you need to actually like in real time, take one MIDI message and transform it into another, you can just come over here into the MIDI transformers. First thing you want to do is to activate a module and we're going to say, we want to transform and we're going to say type is equal to MIDI controller. And then what we want to do is to say value one of that controller, and that's the controller type, subtract. So if we're going from MIDI CC11 and we want to turn that into MIDI CC7, we're going to take 11 minus 7 is 4. So now anytime that MIDI CC11 is transmitted into Cubase, whether it's like an expression pedal or a wheel on a controller keyboard at this point it will now be trans it'll be transformed into midi cc 11. Uh, one question i that we had on the last hangout that i just wanted to clarify because i had my brain cramp on it was with the uh step input was i think john hinchy had asked uh, I know he was on a hangout earlier that it kind of jumps to the beginning of the event. So how to quickly set the position of the step input. And this is so that you could do step recording. So how to do this easily is just to click in the timeline itself. And then the step position will automatically just jump to wherever you click in the edit window like so. And we see that blue line. All right, so we had a question. In the mix window, will it ever be possible to delete a track or move it around by dragging it? Thanks. Uh, so I'm sure you know it's a, it's a very common feature request. I'm not sure why it hasn't been implemented yet. I know that the product planning and the developers are very aware of the desire for that function. So hopefully we'll see it in an upcoming version. I, I don't know the details, but hopefully th that'll finally be released okay um so let's see i got an email i just caught a little white lie in the last hangout at least you claim something that isn't true you said that steinberg's interfaces are unique and including dsp that's not true so how do interfaces from other manufacturers such as motu and uad the issue is that no other manufacturer supports Steinberg's implementation of direct monitoring. I brought up the issue before, then you blame on Apple, which isn't fair. Uh, once upon a time, Steinberg managed to persuade uh, most makers of audio software to adopt a VST, VSTi format for plugins. I wish that Steinberg would sit down with the hardware manufacturers of audio interfaces, there aren't that many, and say, Here's what you need to do to make your DSP compatible with Cubase and Windows implementation of direct monitoring. This would be a win-win for Steinberg, the manufacturers and users. No one buys a Steinberg interface for this feature only. As a matter of fact, my Motu 828ES interface is a feature lacking on Steinberg's offerings that I find far, far more important an inbuilt talkback microphone. But I can use that with the talkback features in control room. This saves me from wasting a valuable mic input only for talkback, and it doesn't get misplaced. Um, this and the fact that both USB and Thunderbolt connectivity was a defining factor when Steinberg forced me to replace my 816. So my point, and maybe I didn't make this clear, but is not that it has onboard DSP, but it's the integration of the DSP into the main program. So this is where the advantage is of the Steinberg interfaces. So let's say if I wanted to come here, let's go to one of my projects that we had set up. So as soon as we activate this project, um, 
So I'll just come here, let's get to the record, and I'll just get to my connections here. And I'll set my outputs accordingly here. Let's see if my... Let's see if my Mac is gonna cooperate. But what we could do that makes it unique is that we actually have um, the, you know, the DSP integrated. So there's no, there's no reason that the other companies can't do this through their own VST plugins. The VSPT protocol has been out for, you know, almost, you know, 25 years now. So, you know, it could be done. People have done it. Uh, most manufacturer companies choose not to. But what makes this unique is when we go to, let's say our outputs and I have my output set to my mix left and right that I could access my, uh, when I go to my record channel, I could access the onboard DSP right here. So I could say, okay, I wanted to, you know, Invert, you know, I want to do a high pass filter. I wanted to reverse the polarity. I wanted to have monitor through my reverb in real time. I wanted to also run it through my guitar amp or my morphing channel strip. And this is using the available onboard DSP of the interface with no latency. So many interface, many companies have this type of functionality, but it's not integrated with the DAW. So, um, that makes it unique because I don't have to toggle to a different program. And that's kind of the advantage of the onboard DSP. And many, many people have bought these interfaces specifically for that. Uh, so I'm glad you're happy with your Motu. I think that's a cool feature, having the TalkBack microphone. Uh, you mentioned that Steinberg uh, forced you to replace your 816. So I'm not sure how we did that. Um, you know, you, if it was an operating system update, you know, it's the interface has been discontinued for a number of years. So, uh, if there is an Apple update that's done that, you know, it's not necessarily Steinberg's fault that the operating system changed and made things, you know, incompatible, you know, but there's responsibility on both sides there. So, you know, just, uh, you know, so while this, you know, capability is there, Steinberg isn't holding back people from doing it. The other manufacturers choose not to. So that's what makes these interfaces unique that I could just open up my reverb and have the reverb directly in the monitors without having to go to a third party program that's not stored within the application. So. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so Tan May had asked about um, after starting Cubase where he saw the instances and he had sent a photo. <clears throat> so this is my new thing I learned. So when we see like instances of Cubase, what this indicates is like when I see my Cubase Pro. Um, so say if I come here, um, Okay, so I see my Cubase Pro 7, I see instances 7. That means that there's different aspects of the program that are actually uh, causing a license uh, that have different licensing components. So there's seven individual licenses that come with Cubase Pro 11, so that may be like a Howling and Sonic SE. It could also be something like uh, one of the licenses might be for Spectral Layers 1. So there's... Um, you know, that's what that's indicating is how many licenses that the program is accessing. And you only see that when you open up the e-licensor after. So you're not running six different versions of Cubase at once. That one version of Cubase has six different licenses that are accessed within it. Okay, we covered the other one. All right, so uh, we had a couple questions. This is with Nuendo, but we'll show it in Cubase. It's gonna have the same functionality. Um, so first about direct offline processing. I'm usually using clip gain on my events before I even touch a fader, giving me a reasonable static mix at a starting point before going 
into details. Unfortunately, direct offline processing doesn't use the applied clip gain for audition playback, which makes it impossible for me to make proper processing decisions. Can adjust to adjacent clip sounds by tweaking high shelves dB by dB. If the audition sound is 15 dB lower uh, than the event in my mix, can you please elaborate on what you guys would do in those situations? Okay, so let's say if I wanted to um, come to this particular file and I'll just make sure everything else is muted here. All right, so I'm going to, let's go to my direct offline processing. All right, so I'm going to not auto apply, but I'm going to, let's say I'll just delete that function. So, and there is a preview button here, so we could audition. So let's say I wanted to take this and I wanted to reverse this. So I can now preview the file and it'll preview it as being reversed. So let's say, okay, now, all right, so I'm gonna adjust the clip gain volume and you hear the adjustment made in the volume in the clip gain just when you preview locally. So if I adjust here, I can hear those changes in real time, but I'm previewing, so I'm just kind of hitting play and then you know, just previewing directly here so that way you could hear those changes as you go along. So the clip gain will be uh, part of the preview process. So I'm not sure if you're not doing the preview from within the direct offline processing or not. Okay, uh, so second question, as far as I understood from all the tutorials, I watched DOP to direct offline processing on an event uh, can be revised and retweaked later. In my understanding, this means that one time I can apply, for example, an EQ and later the process of mixing going back to the same event and adjusting the EQ curve. For that, I would need to be able to recall the formerly used EQ curve. But instead, when going back to that event and opening DOP, uh, I won't see the EQ curve I used uh, on it maybe days before, but instead I'll see the plug-in state uh, as it was in my last DOP operation before going back to that old event. Seems I can, can still remove all formerly used processing on that old event and start all over, but that's not the point of DOP, is it? Uh, I should have access to the formerly used EQ curve. So let's say if I come over here and I just apply a quick EQ, so let's say I go to um, my studio EQ. So I, I have this as my EQ curve and I will just auto apply that. And let's reverse, let's, I'll do a remove DC offset. I will come over here, let's do a fade out. All right, so I want to go to a different file. I want to normalize that file. I'll do a new version. Now I go back to this file and I click on the Studio EQ. Here's where I could adjust the different EQ curves. And now if auto apply is turned on, that's just automatically adjusting the process. So you have to click here in the event and there you could see the different changes. Okay. Um, so question, uh, will there be clipping if my audio channels meters go higher than zero dB? Uh, example, after adjusting clip gain, 24 bit audio files, 32 bit processing. I'm not talking about the master bus, just input channels groups. I couldn't find a real answer to that question when searching the manual. So as the, as the audio file is playing through the engine and it's adding different processing like gain, at that point, it is in the 32-bit floating point realm. So it's gonna be playing back in the 32-bit floating point. So if you render it to like a 16-bit file, you may have clipping, but if you render the final output to 32-bit floating point, you won't run into clipping. All right, um, another question. I recently found out that my brick wall limiter and a master bus uh, will produce different results depending on pre-post fader positions. Uh, fader is always on zero dB. 
What is the logic behind that? In detail, waves, WLM, true peak uh, limiter set to minus 2 dB, testing, TP is minus 0.11 dB when pre-fader, minus 1.89 when post-master uh, fader, both, both times it's 0 dB. So I did some quick processing on this. Um, so I just opened up. So what I did is I took a test tone file and I ran it um, and I exported it with the stock uh, brick wall limiter in, in Cubase here. And it's the same as Nuendo. And I did it at uh, pre and post fader with the same exact settings. And then when I select the event and go to audio statistics, at this point, I go audio statistics, um, and I'll get the same exact functionality here, whether it's pre or post fader. So let's go to the audio statistics here. So we see that we have the same exact meter readouts, whether it's pre or post fader. So maybe it's something with that particular plugin. So if you could try maybe just using the stock uh, brick wall limiter and see if you get the same results, that'd be wonderful to see. All right, let's jump back to our live feed. Thanks for everyone's wonderful questions. Uh, let's see if there's one last minute quick question that we can get in before we wrap up. Um, Okay, so a quick question. Uh, what do composers use that small display with all those colorful boxes in front of them for? Are those shortcuts? Yeah, so what that is, is just a, a device. It's like a touch screen that's firing off macros, keyboard shortcuts, and they find that not having to use the mouse or menu dive, that they have these functions and they uh, generate a muscle memory for it, really speeds up their workflow. All right, so with that, we're just about out of time. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. We'll see everyone on Friday. Please, everyone, stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing everyone on Friday and looking forward to another great live uh, stream. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone, have a great day.